Welcome to uh, Everyday Asphalt. My name is Jim Warren. I'm with Tech Sapa. Glad to have you guys here today. This program is devoted to going a little bit deeper in materials, design, construction, and maintenance. We're taking the engineering course and going a little bit deeper in that to give people a little bit more in there. So, uh, and the other thing is we're looking at the interaction of how all this stuff works together. Which, which is super important because we got to understand how it all, how it all works together. So, and the other thing is, all these programs are on YouTube. We've got our own playlist in here. You can go in here and do that. So all you got to do is go to YouTube, type in TechSapa, and then boom, like, subscribe, and share with all your friends. And uh, we appreciate it. So they'll all be there. All our old uh, Tech Apple Live programs, which is what this replaced, they're on board too in their own separate playlist. There, if you scroll over, you'll find it. So uh, we're, we're good to go. So welcome everybody. Again, we got a great program today. Uh, today we've got Charles Gerganis. Let me bring Charles in. Hello, Charles. Howdy, howdy. Howdy, Jim. Howdy, howdy. Um, you know, we've had, he's with Texas uh, TTI and Texas A&M University. Uh, Charles, give me a brief bio of how you got in all this. Uh, yeah, Jim. Well, I appreciate the invitation to be with you again today. So background is uh, came out of school, um, went to work for TxDOT, spent about 10 years with TxDOT, was okay. the area engineer in the Longview area office, um, had a wild hair, married to a good woman, and decided to go back and pursue a PhD, which tells you probably how crazy I am. So that's what got me into the A&M system, got me with TTI, Pavements and Materials World, obviously, is an area engineer around a lot of highway construction, always liked taking the engineering and, and seeing it put into action with our contractors. Um, so that was always a lot of fun. Did some additional study on that. Um, been in the A&M system since about 2014, okay. um, doing a lot of work on pavements and materials and construction, lots of different stuff. Um, and so and then, you know, been hooked up with you guys at Texapa doing some stuff on and off here since about 2018 on heavy duty pavements yep. and training and lots of different things. Yep, Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, before we get into the pavement stuff, I wanted to talk a little bit because we've been working with you guys a lot on this highway construction workforce partnership. Can you give everybody just a little kind of a nickel tour of what that is, what, what's it, what its intent is and kind of where it's going? Sure. Yeah, we're really excited about this. I appreciate the, you know, kind of the opportunity to plug it. Um, right now, the first thing we're trying to stand up is a 15 week program to get folks into the heavy highway um, industry in current target audience for this 15-week program, 18 to 24-year-olds that maybe never thought about going to college or getting any additional education, can we build them a program, gets them some classroom time, gets them some on equipment at okay. the plant in the lab okay. time, and make them a valuable asset for y'all's members, for the TechSAPA members, coming right out of this 15-week program, get them into a career path um, you know, talented folks into the heavy highway industry with a little bit of that, that initial training that starts to set them apart in the workforce. So they're, they're, they're getting exposed. They will, they will be getting exposed to something that may, they may ne never even knew about. Yeah, exactly. And we want to make sure we kind of hit on all the elements. Do you, you know, do you want to go to work for a paving contractor and do that side of the house? Do you want to go to work at a plant? and be part of the production side, or then maybe even the QAQC side at a lab or with our contractor. And so we're hoping to expose them to all of those things in this 15 week program. Yeah, so we've talked about going to the plant, uh, bringing pavers out to the job. You've got a nope. spot out there on the on the Rellis campus to do some work. Talked about taking them in the lab, actually doing testing and that kind of stuff, showing them construction math, showing them how what stationing is and how to do layout. Uh, man, that's gonna be cool. I'm excited yeah. about it. No, we are too. We're trying to get this thing stood up. Maybe early summer be our first cohort if we're lucky. Okay. Um, so yeah, hopefully have some folks that can enter y'all's industry before Labor Day if we can pull this thing off. That'd so be awesome. That'd be awesome. still in its infancy, but I think we'll get there. Cool, cool. All right. So man, that is a great, great program. We're excited about it. But we're here to talk about pavements today and the heavy duty kind. So you know, you mentioned earlier we've got a heavy-duty pavement committee, and that one of the things the, the, the committee's been kind of struggling with this is what is a heavy-duty pavement? So question to you, what's, what's a heavy-duty pavement to you? 
Yeah, so I think heavy duty pavements can actually probably be one of two things or the combination of those two things. So I'm thinking high 20 year easel loading okay. or a pavement that sees heavy, slow moving loads. So think okay. congested highways, um, maybe even energy sector style stuff that we saw with some of the shale plays earlier, okay. or then obviously the combination of both. So you think about some of our interstates and our metro areas, they see a lot of heavy duty pavements and then there's a few hours in the day where they see i mean they see heavy duty loads but then there's a few hours in the day where it is that creep heavy load so i think we've entered this world where it's one or the other it's an it's an and or situation okay. it can be one or the other or both okay that makes sense that makes sense i mean austin is notorious for having you know there's a number of hours every day it's like Go around 130. <laughs> Don't even try to go go through out there Austin on 35 because you're going to sit, you know. And That's then right. now you've got all that heavy loading just kind of creeping along instead of going along, and we know that changes. So, I mean, years ago we thought 20 million easels was a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. What I mean, from your perspective, what kind of numbers are we seeing now in some of these big, big projects? Sure. I mean, well, I think first off, let's not trivialize 20 million easels because okay. it's still, okay. you know, I mean, it is still a, it's still a big number and it's still um, something we should think about in the design and construction process. But to your point, Jim, we start looking at roadways like I-35 and, and we're going to have to start designing those things for 50, 60 million easels. And then if we get into, and we're talking about a 20 year design life here, right. if, if you actually start to look at the capacity of those facilities Exceeding 80 million easels is not out of the realm of possibility. Wow. Um, but the, the challenge when we start getting into those easels, then you're looking at the geometry of what you actually have available there. And that's where you start getting into the congestion aspect of it. So you just we run, start getting you run out of lanes. You've run out of lanes. Yeah, and so yeah. if we get into this world of 80 million easels, a lot of times those easels are sitting still or they're slow. And so then it becomes a... Are we designing for the right easel loading and this kind of static loading or this non, you know, it used to where we design our pavements for load rest, load rest, load rest. And it's it's really fast loading. Now we're load, gonna have load, to design load, load. for that. <laughs> exactly. But now it's just load. load. It, so those are yeah, so that so it's it's easels plus kind of this maybe more of a dead load type in, in just some of our metro areas. I mean, I'm not saying this is gonna happen all over the state, but it's um, that's what we're looking at. So you're looking out at there static coming. loads, almost creep, going back to like the creep type loading, okay, it, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, you read the newspapers or newspapers, you read stuff and you see kind of what's coming down, down the road. Newspapers we used to read, I get that. Right. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they talk about autonomous trucks. They talk a new term called platooning where they're all kind of locked up together and, and just, you know, so again, that's changing the load, bear, you know, the duration, the speed, the impact. And so, you know, the way we've designed pavements in the past are all based on models and based on certain types of loading conditions. And as you said, if we start changing that, the game starts to change, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It definitely changes. I think things like platooning, Probably they, they could potentially make our lives a little bit easier in, in terms of we our wander is much more defined. Okay. Um, we can identify things through load spectra instead of maybe necessarily just relying on easels. And we can get a lot of that information through way in motion stations. And there's a lot of tools out there that can really help us classify our traffic. And then that takes some of the guesswork out of our traffic loading and what we think we're going to see on that particular pavement. So, um, it, I think it it hones our perspective a little bit on how to design it. But the, the truth is that it also really focuses the heavy loadings that our pavements are going to see. They're going to be very channelized. Uh, and we have to make sure that our design is robust enough to handle it and that our construction practices, material selections mm -hmm. are adequate to get the life, the long-term performance out of our pavement that, um, as an industry, we should want, absolutely. and as the travel and the travelers expect. Yeah, absolutely, uh, you mentioned load spectra and easels. Okay, now easels is a equivalent single axle load, eighteen thousand pound over four wheels. It has a certain parameter. Right. I don't. I've not been around load spectra. Can can you explain that to me? Just maybe, just briefly, kind of what what we're looking at that's different than a, a, an easel. 
or Quimple? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it gets down to an easel is is almost a statistic that we started working on to design pavements back with the Ashto Road test. Yeah, and the, and so yeah. yeah, right. And so, the, but what Load Spectre does is it allows us to better define how those loads are being dispersed over the axles and over the wheels for essentially every vehicle. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, way in motion technology allows us to capture that and have just a better understanding um, of how the specific loads on each vehicle need to go into the design. So it's a little bit um, more uh, maybe it's a disaggregated approach. So with easels, we kind of aggregate a lot of things together and we come up with this easel value and that's how we design our pavements. It served us well. It's not a bad way to do things, but now we, it's um, maybe we're going from, you know, from the hatchet to the knife in terms of our okay. design, okay. right? It's just okay. a little bit more of a honed approach and technologies allowed us to get there. So we're able then to kind of differentiate a, you know, multiple axles, um, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Uh, That's right. Trucks that have got, you know, a, 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 a pup behind them, you know, or, multi, you know, two trailers versus one trailer, tri-axles versus dual axles, that, that, that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And I'm not sure, you know, there's some people that, that are really dialed into this, people like Dr. Fuji Joe here at TTI or Labinda Wallabita, who's okay. done lots of way in motion okay. um, measurements that can probably inform us a little bit more okay. on is this more important on like the dead load that we might start seeing okay. in this really slow condition where then it starts to become really important to understand how that load gets passed over all the axles and different things like that and okay. it which you know may function a little bit more like even kind of like airport design if you really get right down into it in the way they do certain things but anyways okay that, we could chase that tangent but there's it, it's going to help us in the future okay good good that may be a future program we'll do is we'll, we'll get into load spectra and we'll really take yeah. a deep dive there we go <laughs> that's right good yeah. deal so what do we need to do today to start planning for stuff that we're already seeing and stuff that maybe we haven't seen yet, kind of from, from that perspective? Um, so I think, and I don't know, I mean, I'm, I, don't, I hate to say that we're not doing this, but I think we're reaching a point where all of the parties involved need to understand how things fit together from start to finish. Absolutely. You know, yep. I think maybe used to, it was, hey, the owner, whoever that is, develops a plan set, it lets, contractor gets it, contractor builds the product within the plans and specifications. But it feels like we've got to do a better job of designers understanding constructability issues, understanding material limitations, and making sure that each layer within that design is um, built, it, it has the right specifications in the design set of plans and understand why those specifications are built. Why did we okay. select this type of flex space or this type of stabilizer? Why did we select, why are we allowing 10% wrap at one depth and none at another depth? Okay. Why do we need SAC A aggregate as in some parts in SAC B in others? And then making sure our contractors understand why we picked those different elements. And, and if from a, if the contractor says, Hey, we did that over here and it didn't work, making sure we know that in the design, we've got to start tying all of those pieces together. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, we, we need to be good stewards of the materials we use. Absolutely. We need to understand that the loadings are getting heavier. There's I, the moving parts associated with it, if we're not all on the same page from beginning to end, it sets us up for failure in the long term. And so okay. I'm not saying that we're not doing that, but I think a focus on that will lead to better designs and better projects, okay. I think. All right. That, that makes that makes a lot of sense is, is you know, we kind of sometimes I think we, we get into the routine mm -hmm. of doing the same thing over and over. And like you said, you know, and. and you know, my definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, you know. So I think at some point, like you said, we're going to have to all get together. And we're, we're already starting to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, you know, we, we, we've kind of realized that. And so we're, we're starting to have those discussions. And they're kind of tough discussions because <laughs> we haven't had to do that before. 
Right. We, we've always kind of operated in the, oh, that'll work mentality, right? Like, oh, that's a good design. That'll work. Right. And then contractors in the field developing some or building something. And, you know, maybe they're working on something on the fly. It's a little bit of an unknown, unforeseen. Everybody goes, oh, well, that'll work. Well, you know, it, <laughs> And, and sometimes that's true, right. but I think as a whole, we need to start thinking about, well, wh- you know, what if it doesn't and what do we understand why it doesn't? And this is really bringing engineers and con- constructors together so that we understand the goal of every layer in our pavement design and make sure it gets designed properly and built properly. And can we do it better? Can we do it more efficiently? Mm-hmm. Can we do it more sustainably? All those things, I think, are things that we've got to weigh in now as we kind of plug on down the road. Now, I I know you've, I mean, I was going to ask you an earlier question that kind of fell off my brain, which happens a lot more lately. Um, Do you, with your background, do you you consider yourself an academic or a practitioner? (laughs) (laughs) That's a loaded question. I think I should probably let others reserve that judgment. (laughs) I don't, I mean, I like to think that I'm not an ivory tower guy. Um, I, I I started teaching more for A&M and I like being in the classroom. I like being around undergrads. It's a lot of fun, but I really try to take a practical approach to it. Um, I stay in touch with a lot of practitioners and and continue to try to do as much as I can so that I guess I'm not a pure academic. So I try, I try to keep the practitioner mentality, but I'll let others. I'm not trying to use the word academic as a bad word. I was just just kind of curious because I, there, there, there's one in, there's one professor over there. She says I am an academic, and I and I know that. So it's like, <laughs> and so it's a, it's kind of funny. So, um, but in your research, and I know you've done some re, some work for some of our members. You've done some work for us. Um, what have you found that gives you confidence, or or, or maybe says, hey, we can get there, um, and, and 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 maybe some things that we're already doing. Um, what's you know what's working. Uh, yep. How can we how can we move forward with this? How can we achieve these new parameters that we're looking for? Yeah, I mean, we've done some work, um, like you said, for some of your members and for y'all that where we've seen some successes of some flexible payment sections. We went up and looked at a section of US 59 that's a thick HMA section over a stabilized base, um, took some deflection testing up there, and those deflections were similar to what we would see in rigid pavements. Mm. Um, taking a look back at some of the original perpetual pavements that were built in the 07, 08 range, like the I-35 section around New Bronzeville, that's a section that has performed really well. That PFC surface out there lasted for 14 plus years. I think they that'll just work. replaced it. Yeah, yeah this, this year and yeah. payment structure yeah. seems to be great Good. out there. Good. Um, it, that that section is over designed to be honest with you i mean we're fairly certain now with our new design with some design programs and some different iterations that we could do things thinner than what's out there but it's still a success story you start talking about i can't remember what that number is well over 100,000 cars a day um, like a, i saw, it, saw a number 120 or 130,000 adt I, yeah, yeah. ADT, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is a 55 million easel type 20 year design life. So it, it's a success story in the pavement surface out there. That PFC was a success story. I mean, we've seen that in some other locations at a PFC on State Highway 6 northbound coming out of Hempstead toward the Bryan District line. It's another PFC that lasted a really long time. Um, obviously, lighter traffic, but. Um, so we've we've done some work for y'all. We've seen some success stories. Um, we've seen some spots where we didn't have success, and some different thoughts on on why we didn't. A lot of it comes into um, some of our layers below our hot mix layer, especially on some of our thinner sections. We start getting back down around the the four to six inch thick hot mix layer, and we really rely a lot on that base layer underneath to carry some of our loads. And so we've got to pay close attention to that and make sure we get what we want. And if we don't, we start to see some premature failures. And so we've learned a little bit um, from there and and taken those ideas forward and said, well, if we are building heavy duty sections, what do we want to do to those layers to make sure we set ourselves up for success? Maybe not necessarily even in the one or two years post-construction, but this is really success seven years, eight years, 15 years post-construction, because what we want to come back and do is only work on that pavement surface. Amen. and so that's that we've got to get there. We've got to make sure that in our designs, we take that type of mentality with it and that our contractors take that mentality with them into the field. So, yeah, um, yeah we've done quite a bit of work and looked at a lot of different things, seen a lot of successes out there. Yeah. And in the, in the classes that we're teaching right now is mentioning it this week is like, which is easier, or which is cheaper to fix the roof or the foundation? 
you know. Oh, yeah. and, and I think a lot of times when we're building up these pavements, particularly a flexible pavement or an asphalt pavement, you know, we don't really think about stuff till we get to the asphalt layers. Or we don't maybe give it its maybe give it its due for those lower layers, and because oh, we're going to cover them up, we're going to bridge it with yep. the next layer. We'll bridge and, it. Yeah, that's right. Famous, yeah. famous last words, right? <laughs> that's right. Um, but you know, again, I think the philosophy that we've got to start to take to take is every layer counts, every inch counts of each one of those layers, and it's got to be uniform. It's got to be spec material, and it's got to, and it all works together. So I think that's the. One of the messages that we're trying to get out is a flexible pavement is more than just the asphalt. It's the whole thing all the way down to the subgrade. So I think that's a, an ongoing thing that we're starting to, to kind of push out there. Um, switching gears just a little bit, uh, and again, we, we, we had a meeting a week or two ago here on the, on the balanced mix design, or on, the, on heavy duty pavements. We'll get the balanced mix design later. Um, <laughs> You know, FPS 21, which is TxDOT's design program that they've used, and it's the, the current iteration is FPS 21. Um, it's based on kind of some old school technology, right? You know, we all know. Um, do you think that's still going to be a reliable tool? I know they're working on some new stuff. We'll talk about that in a second. But is that still reliable enough to get us moving down the road? It, so FPS 21 is a tried and true program. Uh, and I actually, I do think it continues to serve Texas really well. I do think that we have to acknowledge that when designers use it now in the environment of heavy duty pavements and heavier loads, and just even really thinking about the engineering properties and material properties that enter each of our layers, you you really have to use some engineering knowledge and judgment on how you work in FPS 21 okay. to produce the types of designs that should have a long life. Okay. I think it's still a really good program. I think um, for the most part, it's second to none in terms of flexible payment programs on the market. Okay. You're exactly right okay. that we are moving in directions to advance our flexible payment programs. And we do need to because there's we can start to build other um there we can variables that were kind of unknown and washed in in right. the way we did things right. now we can actually pull them out and say well if we use a certain performance grade binder in this layer and we put a different performance grade binder on the layer above it what does that do to the stress and strains as it goes down through the pavement okay. Okay. we need to move in that direction and we are moving in that direction and so as you use fps 21 it just becomes really important that you understand what its limitations are so that if you're trying to design a heavy duty pavement you do so in such a way that you try to tell the program how to account for those engineering properties whereas the next iteration things okay. like fps 23 tex me you'll you know, it'll be kind of drag and drop. You drag the mix in and it'll make the adjustment on the fly. Okay, FPS okay. 21 doesn't do that yet. So you really got to know how to use it properly. So we've got to engineer the design. Yeah, for sure. Say. Okay. A yes, bit more. I think that's true. And maybe that's something that we need to, since FPS 21 is going to be around for a while, maybe that's another mm -hmm. program uh, or, a, or, a, or a workshop or something that we put together where the designers can, can come in and say, hey, how do I, how do I tweak this? You know, and how do I really understand, you know, the stress strain distributions and the mechanistic models that are in there, and what am right, I looking? What am I looking yep. for in these the the curves that are generated in there? And um, right, and what does it mean when it says it failed due to rutting failure? It failed due to cracking failure, right? Because right. the mechanistic checks in FPS will do that for you, right. but if it fails, you got well, which one is it, and what what material layer could I change? Oh, okay. And is is it is that change in that material layer a constructability issue? Right. So if I go from an unstabilized base to a stabilized base, okay, that's easy enough to do. What does that do to the failure mechanism? Or was I solving the wrong failure mechanism? Right. Gotcha. Was it a was it something else? And so those are some nuances in it. And, and you know, folks like Tom Scullion and Darlene Gale here at TTI are really dialed in on the payment design side of things and can certainly deliver that type of knowledge. So um, well, maybe, it's a good maybe, program. Maybe maybe we need to get a roundtable. Uh, yeah. and just kind of sit and kind of talk through that someday. I think that would be really valuable for the folks out there. And, and if it is, let us know. I mean, uh, send us an email, jwarren at texasasphalt.org. 
uh, and we can kind of go from there. So we kind of talked about kind of what's coming, um, uh, Tex ME or the Tex the TX Mechanistic Empirical Program, which is a new program. Uh, there's FPS 23, which is I guess the current iteration or the the next generation of that. I know they've changed the interface. I've seen some slides of early that where they've kind of changed the interface of it. It's got more of a web-based look to it than kind of a freestanding pro uh, program, um, but it's not on the street yet, right? I mean, I think they're still doing some work with it. Um, what are you seeing from your from what you've seen about that? That and, and you've already mentioned some of that stuff of being able to get the advantage of you know certain types of mixes, polymer modification that we couldn't before. Mm -hmm. I know it's accounting now for um, not a single modulus, but modulus under environmental conditions, which is important uh, for all the different layers in there. It, is that going to get us there? Is that going to, do you think that's going to, from what you've it's seen? Gonna, what? It's, it's going to get us closer for okay. sure. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it's definitely an improvement because the, the challenge with pavements is it's really a multivariable design that then, yeah. you know, and, and then we design on these things like material properties and we use these terms like modulus or stiffness of different layers. And then we have to check ourselves and say, well, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a motor grader with a 12 foot mo board that's honing on that flex base, or it's a lay down <laughs> machine, right. you know, with extendable screeds right. that's going to put that mix down. And so this is where, where I think, I think FPS 23 with the Texemi elements to it are really going to help us do better job in terms of thickness design okay. and the material selection Proper. within those thicknesses. That's put, exactly putting the, right. Putting the right thing in the right place. Okay. But, it, but then we need to be able to convey that, right? So if we say, hey, in the bottom six inches, you can have 10% wrap and it's PG64 minus 22, we need to understand we need more what wrap that is. than that, but yeah, well. Okay. Well, yeah, but you just, you know, so, yeah, so, but, you know, whatever it is, we need to understand, like, right. well, what kind of stiffness are we getting from our wrap? And what does that mean our binder content really needs to be? Do we have a good understanding sure. of that? Sure. And, sure. and then make sure that's what gets built. Um, so we've got, we really have to start the next, the frontier is the proper um, segue from the design to the construction okay. and putting all of the pieces together. Okay. That and FPS 23 is going to help us on the design yeah. side. And, and it also pulls in the material side as well. So it's yeah, that, that's, that's right. Uh, as, Joe it acknowledges, as, as Joe Lighty says, it's kind of that three-legged stool, right? you got materials, right. design, and construction. Maintenance is kind of the thing on the top, but if you do, if one of those legs is broken, well, then you're going to end up on the floor. You're going to thump over, right? And it acknowledges yeah. that the material aspect of it is integral in the design part. And and you know we're we're capturing those things better in our in our new design gotcha. Uh, software. Gotcha. Awesome. You know, Texas is not alone in looking at all this stuff. There's a lot of other people in a lot of other places. There's good researchers all over the country and. Uh, I know Dr. David Tim at Auburn has been doing a lot of stuff. Uh, he's, he's developed some programs uh, per road and uh, uh, some of the other programs. Uh, I can't, uh, can't remember the other one off the top of my head. I'm going to get yelled at here in a minute. Um, but there's a lot of good programs out there. And, and I've heard him say the word limiting strain theory. Okay. Where we're. Can, can you explain? You want, that? you want me to take a crack at that? Yeah, take a crack at it. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, I think I know, so but I, you tell me because then, then I can agree with you. Because yeah, yeah, I, so I, don't, I don't want you to say, oh, no, that's not what it is at all. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have done that because I'd be scared that I'm, the, I'm wrong. But I'll tell you what I think. Okay. So if, if we think about a flexible pavement design, the stiffness of our layers changes throughout that pavement structure. Correct. Where our stiffer layers are on top, obviously, Correct. right? And, one of the largest, if not the largest, change in stiffness comes where that hot mix layer meets that base course or the, an the unbound. Interface. That's right. exactly the okay. interface. All right. So as the base layer bends more than the hot mix layer because it's not as stiff, okay. um, if if you don't limit that strain in the bottom of that hot mix layer okay. as that flex base layer is bending, a crack will form. That's the tensile, and the, the tensile strain at the bottom the, of the asphalt the, layer. The right? tensile strain right, right there at the bottom of that, right? Because right. as, as it bends more, this the bottom of your hot mix layer is okay. in tension. Okay. And so if you can't limit that, 
every time it gets loaded, it's like bending a paper clip back and forth, right? In that eventually. at the bottom of that hot mix layer, it eventually a crack forms. And as you keep bending it, that crack propagates to the top. Now you have a spot for water to go and then all things are also we want to limit right. the that strain at okay. the bottom of that layer okay. to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. So we can design a pavement or the idea is designing a pavement to minimize that strain in that layer by combination of layers and thicknesses and materials. And stiffnesses, and that's exactly right. right. Yep. And then yep. so we never get there, right? Yep. And so yep. we protect our foundation, shall we say, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and the idea is to drive the distress up to the top, and then we'll just re-roof it at some point. Going down no, I think you, you, right, because we can, it, dealing with a crack that starts at that interface and comes all the way to the top is very expensive. Dealing with something that only happens on the surface is just part of owning any asset, just like your home right. example. You right. own a home, you're going to have to put a new roof on it. Um, that's just part of it. Okay. Okay. That yep. makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Hopefully, Dr. Tim thinks that's a decent enough answer. I'll, I'll <laughs> check with him. I don't know if he wants yeah, it. But I'll send him the link. So he, that's right. Yeah. yeah. I'll let you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, the, 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 you mentioned it earlier, there's, there's this perpetual pavement concept out there, which does sort of look at that, and you've, you've said we've actually built some pavements that kind of have that, we didn't necessarily mm -hmm. build them as perpetual pavements, even though in the pavement manual, I think it's chapter five, they discuss the perpetual pavement concept, where we're, we're building the pavement one time, and we're building the foundation or the lower layers in such a fashion where we can drive that distress to the top. That makes a lot of sense to me as somebody who has to pay for the roads, okay? Mm -hmm. um, as, as we're not having to go out there and tear the whole thing out, we can renew the surface and then it, you know, we can take advantage then of any new materials or new processes or new binders or, or whatever, uh, you know, 15, 20 years down the road when we've got to do something to it. And so who knows, I mean, 15, 20 years, I hope I'm not still doing this. I, I love what I do, <laughs> but I'm getting old, and uh, eventually I want to go sit in the desert somewhere. So, all right, so let's move on. Um, balance mix design, okay. Uh, Textile has, has an effort that they started in 2019. Um, there's a lot of colleges, or most of the, co the universities in Texas are involved in it in some way or fashion. I know TTI is, is kind of leading the charge on that with John Epps and Amy Epps and mm -hmm. Epps Martin uh, and, and, and Fuji and some other folks in there. Um, uh, and that the idea behind that is to balance the rutting behavior and the cracking, beha the cracking resistance and the rutting resistance behavior by actually doing performance tests, which makes sense. We'll do a program on that at some point in the future. Can we, do, can we have a balanced payment design? Where I we, think, I mean, is that the, yeah. is that what, that's kind of what we're talking about, right? That, that's exactly what we're talking about. And I think maybe to even carry the, the balance aspect of it all the way to the top, we've got to have a balanced pavement design okay. because especially you think about that tough surface. What are we worried? Let's assume for a minute that we build our structure exactly how we need it. It is a good, robust structure. So all we're worried about is the long-term performance of that pavement surface. Gotcha. Well, if that's the case, what are the two things we're worried about in our pavement surface? We're worried about it rutting. And right. when I say it rutting, I'm talking about just that pavement surface. So or we're worried about plastic deformation. Okay. Plastic deformation yeah. in okay. the surface mix, right. whatever lip, two inches of surface mix, right. whatever it is. Okay. Or we're worried about it cracking. Um, Probably some sort of near surface cracking, you know, high shear stresses near the surface that cause that near surface cracking. Right. So we have got to start designing these tough mixes that balance those two things that are we're not going to see, you know, significant plastic deformation in that top layer or that, you know, near surface cracking that then didn't then needs um intermediate maintenance actions that we don't want to have to provide because we don't want to go right. on a roadway that has 60 million easels in 20 years and have to set up traffic control every couple of years. We want to yeah. show up after 10 to 15 years and do our thing. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to balance that performance on the top to make sure we get that, the, the long-term life out of it that we want. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So let's, let's kind of, let's start at the bottom. Say we're going to build one of these heavy duty pavements. So we start at the bottom. Obviously, the subgrade 
is whatever we've got wherever we're at. And that's we've got a lot of different subgrades in Texas, right? That's right. From rock yep. to sand to yep. goo. To bad clays. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yep, um, yep. So on top of that, assuming we, we get to something that's uh, suitable, okay, build me, build me a structure from the bottom up. What kind of things should we be looking for? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll actually jump into the subgrade because, uh, okay. you know, this is what makes civil engineering fun and, and high, heavy highway fun, right? We, we got to work with what God gave us because right. it's it's what's available and economical. So we do need to really think about our subgrades. We need to make sure we're taking enough samples to classify that material, where changes exist. Yep. Where do yep. we need to change between cement and lime? Do we have a good feel for that? Okay. If we have to use lime, are we going through the proper lime demand test? Because if we've got goop or, or very uh, high PI high clays, PI, yeah. you know, we, we really need to think about are we putting enough lime in those materials? This has everything to do with long term performance. Are right. we really conditioning those so they're going to last a long time? So okay. we need to think about how we treat those. Then I'll be honest with you, if we're talking about 50, 60 million easels, as we come up into a base material, I'd treat my base. I would probably put something like cement in it. Um, just because if we go back to limiting strain theory, if we limit, if we increase the stiffness the, of that base, right. that's right. You, you minimize that the air transfer. void. Right. Okay. That's right. It's the transfer. So I would, uh, you know, and it depends on how thick you're going to need those bases. And a lot of that's going to be driven by, um, you, by how you set your pavement design up on how thick you want your hot mix layers. Right. But we also have to think about by treating your subgrade. And then compacting your base and treating your base on top of it, you're just creating stiffness and stiffness to compact that next layer against it because it's so good much point. easier. That you're right. I mean, because, yeah, you know, if you really, if you really need to, if you roll this, I'm stealing this from Dr. Roger Smith that was at A&M. But, you know, if you really got to roll your sleeping bag up to fit it in a tight spot in your car, you put it on the floor to roll it up. You don't Not roll it up mattress. on the mattress. Exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> and the same is true for our pavement design. So That's let's get point. some stiffness, get some stiffness. And on top of that stiffened base material, then you can start coming in with your hot mix layers. And we need to, we need to identify the right content of wrap because we need to be good stewards. Right. And it, this gives us a really great opportunity to figure that out the right way, mm -hmm. not turn our road into a linear landfill, but reuse the materials that we've got to find that right stiffness, make sure we're adding the proper amount of binder in say that six inch layer sitting right on top of our base material. Yep. Um, what can we use local aggregates in that bottom six okay. inches? We really need to figure those things out. And there's some work to be done across the state regionally, how we do that the best we can. And then we start getting into our upper layers where we need to start thinking about toughness, long-term durability. Um, where do we make the switch to SAC A aggregates? Okay. Okay. 50 million easel surfaces have to have SAC A aggregates in right. it. Right. The, the owner needs to be willing to pay for it. Contractors need to know that's what they're going to have to provide. It, it, we got to go get it and put it in there because if we're going to get those really tough surfaces, that I think that's I think that's non-negotiable on the top. So that's kind right. of a quick, you right. know, that just a real quick with no, you know, no real um, engineering behind it, just kind of based on heuristics and what I've seen. That's that's where I would start at well, least that, conceptually. It, it, I think that's a I I think that makes sense, and and I think that you know the one thing that we talked about last week. Uh, in the meeting here was, again, what you just mentioned, that interface between the base material and the asphalt, that asphalt layer has got to be strain resistant. If it doesn't have enough asphalt in it. Right. That's right. And, and there's a lot of ways you know, to minimize that, right? right? We can stiffen that base layer so it's not moving as much. That might, and I say might, I don't know this, might allow us to increase wrap content okay. closer to the bottom or... And again, I don't know this either. Should we sandwich our wrap content? This goes back into the philosophy of the rich bottom right. layer where right. you would put something with some more tensile strength. I think it all depends on how deep it is and kind of doing that mechanistic analysis okay. on that strain criteria. All right. So there's that makes sense. And, and the, and that's where you get into if you try to do these things in the current FPS 21, you really have to engineer it. You got to think about those layers. Okay. Um and, and understand how you think they'll behave. And, okay. and hopefully TexME helps okay. us do that a little bit, maybe in a more user-friendly environment. Okay, so we've got lots of opportunities there moving forward. 
to to use these different materials that are available, but but get them in the right place. That's right. In the right thickness, okay. And so, yep. and then we got to build it right, right. And yes. we got to we yep. got to compact it right, and all that sort of stuff. So I, again, I wanted to try to get back to that because the stuff that we kind of stuff that we already know, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if we build it smoother to begin with, it's going to last longer, right? Sure. Uh, yep. There seems to be real good evidence if we get the air void level to the correct level, which is necess not necessarily the minimum that's going to last. Please, please more than the minimum. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> going to last longer. And so it, it seems to me that that stuff we can do right now, even with our existing roadways. And, sure. And, and, and the, the, the neat thing about TxDOT spec is that's their incentive for ride. There's yep. an incentive for placement uh, in place air voids, and we just need to figure out how to go get that. And yeah. it's not necessarily, I mean, you talked about constructability earlier, and some pavements aren't necessarily going to be easy to construct because of how it's put together, and that may impact the, 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 what density we can get because if we've got a soft area underneath, it's we're, again, we're trying to rolling up the sleeping bag on the mattress. Great, That's right. Great analogy. Great analogy. Uh, and the same thing with the ride. So uh, there, I think there, there's great opportunities there. Um, I don't know where we're at on time, but I'm having a lot of fun. So hopefully everybody else is still kind of hanging in there. But um, uh, I'm going to make you king for the day, okay? All right. So king for the day. Scary thought. I know. I know. You got to start wielding the sword. Game of Thrones. That's right. Game of Thrones stuff. Um, what would you change? From any of the materials, any of the design stuff, just king for the day. What would you? What What would be the uh, Gerganus um, uh, pavement design uh, uh, process? The The rule of the House of Gerganus, benevolent <laughs> dictator, where everyone is successful. There we go. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, you know, I think we we got to start at the beginning, and when I mean beginning, I mean project concept. Um, okay. So what? It, what I would tell any owner, whether it be TxDOT, a city, another DOT, is that don't artificially confine yourself to an estimate in the advanced planning phase oh, when you start okay. thinking about your pavement design. Okay. I think sometimes, and it's a little bit of the nature of the beast in funding. Yo, we, we know we need this project. We need to stick a dollar amount on it. Make sure, and I'm not saying this happens because I really don't know, but make sure you don't get so hung up on that dollar figure that you sacrifice something in your pavement structure. Mm. If you're going through the process and you go, oh, we'd really like to cement treat that 12 inches of base material, but we didn't include it in the first estimate, and this is 20 miles of new interstate third lane construction, well, we're not going to put cement in the base. Right. Man, you're really sacrificing the future to save that money on the front end. So I, I just as okay. you're setting up your project estimates very early in the design process, over-design your pavements so that you can have that long-term performance. Then you can tweak that, it oh, in, right? You can okay. tweak it in, okay. and you can have right. that long-term flexibility to change your pavement designs. Obviously, ultimately, you want to optimize it, but don't paying yourself on the front end. So if you ever run into that, please try to, you know, kind of, kind of break that cycle. Okay. Um, that's, and then that's, a, that's really good advice. I hadn't even thought about that. That's really good advice. Cause it, it all comes back to how much money do we got to spend? Right. It right? happened. Yeah. If we go back yeah. to your house analogy, yeah. if I start renovating my house and I think, Oh, I'm going to spend 25 grand on this. And then the contractor comes in and goes, well, Hey, I know you'd really like to replace your cabinets, but it's going to be five grand extra. All of a sudden you end up with your same old cabinets in it. And the wife is still not happy when the remodel's done. We'll and just, you spend we'll $25,000. We'll yeah. And exactly. add new that's, hardware. That's the, <laughs> right. So I, I mean, that's, I think there's a lot of truth in that, and, and we all do. And so I'm not saying anything nefarious or bad is going on. I just think it's something that if we don't acknowledge it, sometimes maybe we can fall into that trap. Um, you know, that and then sense. we've that then we've got to start yeah. making sure if we have that money that we design every layer. We look at every piece of it and understand what I want it to do. I want 
I want to stabilize my subgrades because it's an insurance policy. It makes them less moisture sensitive. Okay. Whether or not they will or will not ever see moisture, the same is true for the base, right? Hopefully they never get water into them, but it's an insurance policy for the long-term performance. And so really looking, not necessarily looking at, you know, oh, I've got this much pavement. This is what I think, but every different layer. And then what I would do Let's think about how we take that into construction. What quality control, quality assurance techniques should we start deploying to make sure we get it? Maybe we should start supplementing density measurements with deflection measurements on every layer. I know it takes a lot of time. I'm not saying it's appropriate for every project, okay. but if I'm designing something for 50 million easels, if I think my subgrade should have a certain deflection in it, why don't I check it before I put my base on it? Why don't I check as I come up and supplement my density measurements with some deflection testing to make sure we're getting that stiffness all the way up? I think it's a great tool and makes, again, it's just another insurance yeah. policy. I don't know how we have the, you know, we got to figure out how we get the bandwidth how we get the resources out there to do it but um on some of these projects i think it's worth our time and money so i mean those are just a couple of okay. things that come to mind good. that i would think about if, good. you good. know if i could just write the check <laughs> good stuff good stuff yeah i mean i, I thought about that i mean it definitely it, it moves the cheese a little bit right and i think people yeah. that talk you know who, who moved my the book who, who moved my cheese but it's, it's still a good analogy is like who moved my stuff Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and the folks around here at Texapa know in the studio, they know not to touch anything because right? I've, I've threatened every one of them because there's so many wires and so many knobs and stuff. And we had that problem getting started here today um, just so we could hear each other. Uh, it's, it's just I don't want someone to move it, but I know one of these days I'm going to have to tear it all down and move it around a little bit and getting that set up again, this process. So, so um but I think I think we've got to be willing um, to be able to roll with the punches, if you will, as we deal with different circumstances coming coming towards us in the future. Right? Texas isn't getting any smaller. We're going to see more loads. We're going to see more people. You know, and we're wearing out some of the roads that never were intended to have the loads and the people on them. Right? Mm -hmm. And so we've got to be able to think ahead and start maybe start thinking. Even if it's a low volume road, think maybe think the think this long term pavement concepts or these perpetual concepts uh, in the process. So we've got something out there that if something changes, we don't have to go all the way to the bottom. We can just maybe add to the top. I mean, is that kind of does that make sense? Oh, it's it, it may, everything you said, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, what is it? U.S. News and World Report last year, five of the top 10 fastest growing counties in the country are in Texas. Ooh. So we're in, in, then, you know, some of those counties are what we would have used to call rural counties, like Kauf, like Kaufman County, for example, okay. is the fastest growing county in the country. So why? Uh -huh. Because, because Rockwall County is already built out. Collin County's already built out. You have the sprawl coming out of DFW. The next county to go to is Kaufman. Okay. We would have considered that a rural county not too long ago. Yeah. So how are we going to yeah. rebuild yeah. the pavements in somewhere like Kaufman County? That's Make sure we do it right. Yeah. And then you, then if we tie it back to, you know, talking about should we start using deflection testing? Well, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. Is it also an opportunity to think about what the next incentive portion of our specification is? If you give me a wow. stiffness okay. above a certain stiffness, okay. how valuable is that to me as the owner as an insurance policy? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I think it's worth industry saying if we want to build these things for the future – we like the incentive disincentive part of ride quality. Yeah, yeah, we like yeah. the, maybe we don't like it, but we, we, you know, the incentive disincentive part of air voids. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's overall, it's a good thing. Um, so are there other incentive disincentive aspects that we should start looking at? And I think that helps us build for the future, Jim, if we're thinking about the next frontier and what to think about. So we're really at that point looking at true performance testing. Right? I think so. So yep. inst instead of saying, you know, instead of saying, get it to a certain amount of air voids, which, we infer is going to give us a certain mm -hmm. amount of performance. You mm -hmm. know, even with the balanced mix design, we're looking at rutting, you know, rutting and cracking yep. resistance. But now you're you're actually going one more step. Is now we're going to now we're going to put the whole thing together, and now we're going to see what kind of parameters it's got. Fascinating. Uh, that awesome. Yep. Uh, challenge, challenge me again, Charles. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> give me more night. Give me more nightmares now. Okay, it's, all right. Jo- job security. That's what. That's the way I view it. <laughs> I got plenty of work to do. Uh, <laughs> I know. Good that, deal. Uh, that makes hey, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, you. This was great. I really. I've always enjoyed talking to you. I thought this went extraordinarily well. I hope you folks out there uh, got a couple nuggets out of it. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe think a little bit differently if you're in the design world to start to. Thinking about, you know, instead of just plugging the stuff in and hitting the button, start thinking about engineering the design. And I guess we need to talk to more, maybe some more about maybe trying to go a little bit deeper, even further about understanding how to use this current system to its maximum potential, shall we say, uh, and understand, you know, what we can do. And then once we get into the new system, when that is released, you know, we're going to have to do a whole bunch of training on that and education, Mm -hmm. make sure people understand how to how to work that interface and, and engineer these uh, pavements so um, awesome brother hey thank you so much uh, Charles uh, always always a great opportunity to talk to you and I, I very much appreciate it thank you so oh, thank much you, Jim. I'm gonna slide you out of there ladies and gentlemen thank you that concludes our program for today thank you so much for being part of everyday asphalt we will be back next month on the third Thursday and we're looking forward to seeing you then so Take care, everybody. Be safe out there and ever forward.